OK, XSLT30. Um, on the 1st of April, we will have been working longer on XSLT30 than we worked on XSLT20. So um, I'm not sure if we should be proud of that. Um, it took us seven years to produce 2.0 from 1.0, and we're now seven years from, um, from 2.0. So it's a slow process, um, but I think we've made quite a bit of, quite a bit of progress, and, and that's what I'm going to try and describe. Um, in a talk like this, I'm always sort of conscious that some of you know quite a lot about it, and some of you know very little. Um, so I'll try and provide a bit of interest for, for, for everyone on that spectrum. Um, as Jonathan described, the current status is that XPath 3 has got ahead of XSLT3. XPath 3 is now proposed recommendation. Um, once you've got the proposed recommendation status, really nothing can stop it apart from um, either a gross political upheaval, um, a meteorite, or apathy. Um, the apathy coming because Liam has to ring up all the people who vote and say, vote, it's important. Um, so if you're if you're an, a representative on the W3C and you don't vote, then it, it might just not happen. Um, and of course, the votes aren't necessarily from the people who are really interested in making it happen. So XPath 3 is ahead of, of XSLT3. Um, but XSLT3 um, has now made quite a bit of progress in the last few months. Um, we got to last call working draft in December. Um, and what last call working draft means is that um, we're supposed to be very disciplined about not, not adding things, not changing things unless there's really a bug that needs to be fixed, um, ironing out the inconsistencies, responding to comments. Um, we have slightly different views about this. My view is that last call period is also a period for usability testing. It's a period when people are exposed to the spec, where they try it out, where they give us feedback on whether it actually meets requirements or not. And, and to my mind, it's very important during the last call period that the working group should be responsive to that feedback. That's the whole purpose of having the last call, that people can tell us we've, you know, we've, yes, we're not adding new features, but if people tell us, I can't use this unless you, um, un unless you fill this gap, then that's feedback that the working group um, should certainly listen to. Um, but it doesn't mean that we add things that are way outside the scope of the original requirements list. Um, so before talking about 3.0, let's have a little bit of a review um, as to where we are with XSLT 2.0, because the success of 3.0, we sort of have to evaluate um, how these things are actually moving forward. And you get mixed views about whether or not XSLT 2.0 is successful. Um, some people will tell you there aren't any implementations. Well, actually, there's lots of implementations. There are far more implementations of XSLT 2 than there are, for example, of PHP. And no one would tell you that PHP is a failure. Um, so measured by a number of implementations, it's certainly an enormous success. <coughs> um, but some people are only interested in open source implementations. And the interesting thing is that most of those aren't open source. Um, so that's a disappointment to people who've grown up on XSLT being open source software and being free and, um, and, and so on. And, um, what you find is that the popular XSLT 1.0 processors, the popular open source processors, um, if you take um, Zalan, MSXML, um, LibXSLT, the um, Microsoft.NET processor, and of course the processors running in the browsers, none of those have been upgraded to 2.0. Um, why not? That's an interesting question to ask. Um, I think the answer is because the immense value that people are getting from those processors somehow hasn't fed its way back into any kind of business case for the people developing those processors um, to, to take them forward. Um, so in a sense, that's not a failure of XSLT 1.0. It's a failure of the, 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 the open source business model um, to get some feedback of the value that people are getting from the software and translate it back into further development of that software um, to increase that value. Um, so what's happened is that people have taken it forward um, on a more commercial basis, um, which is fine for some users and not so fine for, for others. Um, so people are still using. The, the other way of looking at this, of course, is that if people are sticking with 1.0, then that's probably because 1.0 meets their requirements. And when you're developing a, a, a new version of something, 
you have to accept that um, the, the reason you're developing it is because there are some people for whom the existing standard isn't adequate. Um, but to assume that the existing standard isn't adequate for anyone would be a gross admission of failure. Um, clearly, XSLT10 is extremely successful and meets a lot of people's needs, and they don't actually need to move forward. But at the same time, we all know that there are lots of things it doesn't do, and that lots of users have benefited from 2.0. And 2.0 has proved very popular with the people who are using it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a success on, on that measure as well. So I mention that because that sort of sets the scene for, um, for, for 3.0. Um, and when we look at the things that are motivating 3.0, um, I think one can, one can say that it's top-end requirements. 90% um, of XSLT 2.0 users probably don't need any new features. Um, but the 10% who are at the edge of what you can do with XSLT need some new things very badly. So in a sense, what we're doing with 3.0 is, is, is stretching the boundaries a bit further, therefore catering for the people who are at the boundaries in terms of their requirements and, and what they can currently do. Um, so I don't see 3.0 as being um, necessarily a, 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 a release for the masses. I see it for a, as a release for the people who are, who are stretching what the technology can do already. Um, so two big things, two big focuses in the development are streaming, which is all about handling large documents, packaging, which is all about handling large style sheets, um, and then filling in some of the functionality gaps that, that, that occur. Um, Jonathan already mentioned try-catch, very important to some people. Dynamic ex-path evaluation, also important um, to people. Um, let's start with packaging, which is perhaps less familiar than streaming, partly because there aren't any implementations out there yet. Um, existing style sheet modules, um, you can write a, a style sheet consisting of lots of modules, um, but those are very closely coupled together. The variables in one style sheet are visible throughout the whole style sheet. The, the functions are visible everywhere. Everything's public, everything's global. Anything can be overridden anywhere else. Um, so what happens is that if you're developing a, 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 a big suite of style sheets, um, you get real spaghetti problems. It's really hard to find out where a particular element in your source document is processed because that template can be overridden 300 in 300 different places and, and, and working out what code needs to change is a nightmare. Um, overrides on overrides on overrides accumulate over the years um, and it's very hard to control that. Um, so when you've got a big body of code, then managing it gets extremely difficult. Um, so packages are an attempt to, to, to solve that problem. Um, a package is a collection of style sheet modules um, represented by an XSL package element. You can still use include and import within a package, so we've now got two levels of modularity. You've got style sheet modules within packages and then packages within the, um, the overall application as a whole. And use package is the equivalent of import and include, say that one package includes another. Um, but the difference between use package and include import is that um, visibility of things is much more tightly controlled. Um, we can now declare the visibility of components. By components, I mean functions, variables, templates, modes, basically all the things you can name in a style sheet. And you can now declare which of those are visible outside your package. Um, you can make them public or private. You can make them abstract, so the, the caller of your package has to supply an implementation. Um, you can um, make them final, which means people outside can use them, but they can't override them. Um, and that affects scoping of names as well. If you define a private name for a function, then another person can define a, another private function with that name, and the names don't clash. Um, the other thing is that when you do allow overriding of components, um, the overriding has to be type safe. One of the reasons you can't do separate compilation of modules in XSLT currently is that overriding doesn't have to be type safe. I can override a function that expects an integer with one that expects a string, or, an, or a function that returns an integer with one that returns a string, which means when I, when I look at a particular style sheet module, 
and I see a function call, I have no idea what it's going to return because it might be declared to return an integer, but by the time it's been assembled into a bigger thing, it's going to return something completely different. Um, so that type safety isn't there, and, and that really prevents any kind of separate compilation of, of, of modules currently. Um, so why do we need packages? Because people are writing big applications. Um, this is just a sample of ones that are in the public domain. Um, DocBook, I counted 357 modules, and the Qt specs, which we use for developing our, our, our internal stuff. And I have to say, we're like cobbler's children. You know, we, we use our own technology, and we use it really badly. Um, but at least we understand how badly it can be used. Uh, these modules just sort of grow. Everyone writes a new one, and there's no discipline. There's no, uh, there's no architect in, in the center who says, no, you can't possibly write that module. Someone's already written that somewhere else. You know, do it differently. Um, DITA 255, TEI 303 modules, lots of, of, of XSLT modules. And thinking about when you've got something with 300 modules, having a global namespace for, for all your functions. I mean, yes, you can use namespaces, and some people are clever and, and smart and do, but it is essentially a, a, a global space of names. Um, that gets pretty undisciplined. Um, these are just things in the public domain. If you look at the, um, at the publishing workflows that some of the publishers have got, or if you look at some of the sort of enterprise integration buses that big enterprises and banks use, then I'm sure you can find far bigger collections of, of style sheets than these. People are using it as a very serious programming language for writing big systems, and they need the kind of software engineering support um, that goes with that. So the benefits we're looking for with packaging, we're looking for software engineering benefits in terms of the usual things like information abstraction hiding, um, independent development of components, um, well-defined interfaces between components so that you can swap in and swap out components interchangeably. Um, basically, improving the potential for change for a system and its maintainability. Um, we're looking for commercial benefits. People want to sell style sheets. One of my customers um, for Saxon for years has complained about this. Their, their intellectual property is all tied up in style sheets. And, and, and they have real problems that, that, that it's very hard to ship those style sheets to customers in a way that protects their intellectual property. Um, and we're looking for performance benefits on the, on the compile time side. Um, if you have to compile 203 modules every time you run a transformation, um, then that's a serious problem because the compile time starts to grossly exceed the, the run time. Um, and having, having modules that are pre-compiled and can be loaded in the classic sort of um, architecture that people are used to with other languages um, clearly has benefits. A, a split between not just compile and runtime, but compile and then link and then run um, ought to mitigate some of those problems. Um, there's some new syntax associated with packages. Here's just an illustration. Um, you have an XSL package element. Um, the XSL package can say which other packages it uses, um, and there's a little bit of primitive version control on that, so you can give a range of versions that you're, pr that you're prepared to use that other package. Um, you can say, you can restrict what things you want to import from that package with an XSL accept, so you don't have to accept everything that it, that it exposes. And you can say which things are in there you want to override, and all, all those overrides are in one place, so you can, you can see what it's changing. You can't override things all over the place. They've got to be centralized. Um, you can then use XSL Expose to say what things you're publishing to the outside world, what the users of your package are, are allowed to use. Um, and then you can have a bit of style sheet code. The bit of style sheet code might just be an important include, or it might actually in include the, the, the body of your, your logic, uh, your public functions and methods that say what you're exporting. Um, and then the rest of, within that style sheet, it's all existing code, but with some new additions like visibility attributes on things um, to, to, to control visibility. <laughs> so that's packaging. Um, the, the second major plank is streaming. Streaming is about the ability to process a large document um, without first building a tree in memory. We've got quite a few um, 
quite a bit of talk about streaming at this conference coming up. And it's all sort of complementary um, to each other. I'm go try and, going to try and avoid too many overlaps there. I'm talking this afternoon about um, the streaming implementation in Saxon. Abel Braxma is, uh, is also talking about um, work he's been doing on streaming. Um, and we've done a little bit of coordination, so I hope you're not hearing the same message three times. Um, but this is about, so the focus here is on what's in the, what, what's in the spec. Um, why streaming? Um, from my point of view, primarily the ability to transform very large documents. Some people already are also very interested in, in latency, which means that you start to see results before you've read the whole thing. Um, some people are hand, interested in handling, well, same thing under a different name, interested in handling real-time data feeds where perhaps the data is infinite, it never actually stops. And if you, if you wait until the satellite breaks down before you can report its results, that, that's not a good idea. You want to process the data feed as it's arriving and, and, and deliver real-time reporting of that, of that feed. Um, people ask, does streaming help me when I'm handling small documents? Um, the answer is it doesn't improve the performance of an individual transformation. Um, don't expect that. Um, streaming doesn't make things faster. What it does is it reduces the resources needed. So if you're running a web service that's doing, you know, three million transformations a, a second, um, then the, the reduction in memory resources may well be useful to you. But it's not actually going to speed up an individual transformation. Um, the design approach and the language for how we handle streaming, um, first of all, we define a streamable subset of the language. That's not just a, a syntactic subset. It's a set of rules, a set of constraints. If you're going to write streamable code, it has to satisfy these rules. Um, if you just did that, then that would restrict you too much. There would be too many use cases that you couldn't satisfy. So as well as restricting the language to say you have to follow these rules, we've provided new constructs that are designed for streaming to, set, to actually make real practical use cases possible to write. Those constructs aren't confined to streaming, but they're particularly designed to, to, to make streaming possible. Um, and we haven't just def defined a streaming transformation language. What we've done is allow, defined a transformation that allows streaming alongside other things. So very often, you'll have a streamed document, and you'll have other documents that are unstreamed. Most real-world transformations involve multiple documents. Many of them are quite small. Um, so you can mix the things together. Um, there's a mode of processing which is often very suitable, which, we, which um, I tend to call burst mode streaming, other people call windowed streaming, um, where if you've got a very flat document, like you've got an employee file with, with, with 100,000 employees in it, um, so you've got 100,000 elements at level two in your tree, then quite often the streaming approach will be to process each employee in turn, and you can build a tree for each employee and process it in the normal way, and then move on to the next one. But you, don't have, you never have to build the whole document as a tree. Um, the memory is bounded by the amount of space needed to hold a single employee element. So that, that sort of mode, if you like, partial streaming, is very, very, very often useful in practice and important, and, and, and we make sure we just support that. And so there's a set of streamability rules. These are the restrictions on what you can write in your style sheet in order to be, for it to be streamable. Um, we've rewritten these rules several times, um, and they're, again, completely rewritten in the latest draft. Um, and they are complicated, um, sadly. Um, we, we didn't go out of our way to make them complicated. Um, there's a design compromise between making the rules, um, making the rules simple and making the rules give a predictable result. Um, the reason we have complicated rules is to ensure that things you would think are streamable actually are. So the idea is that hopefully most of the time your intuition as to what's streamable will turn out to be correct. Um, but in order to make your intuition correct, we actually have to make the rules quite complicated, and that's, that, that's a trade-off. 
And some of the concepts in those rules, um, a lot of new terminology there. What's the sweep of an expression? The sweep of an expression is how much of the input it reads. Um, so if you, uh, if you call the name function on an element, that doesn't need to move the input document at all. It can just look at the start tag. If you want the string value of an element, that has to reposition the stream. That has to read everything between the start tag and the end tag. So that's the concept of sweep, which is how much of the input does a particular expression need to read. Um, posture is a rather more complicated concept, and that relates to um, when you're selecting a, a set of nodes, how do they relate to each other? Um, are you selecting a set of nodes that are all on the ancestor axis, which gives you one set of constraints? Are you selecting a set of nodes that are peers or children, they're all on the same level and none of them contains another one? Um, call that striding posture and that gives you another set of constraints. Or are you reading sort of everything crawling the tree, um, including nodes that are ancestors and descendants of other nodes? That again changes the constraints. Um, Usage says, how is the result of an expression being used by another expression? Um, if um, I use the, the reverse function or the sort function, then I'm reordering the nodes in my input. If I use XSL number, then I'm navigating from the input node to somewhere else in the document. Um, if I use a, a function like sum, then I'm atomizing the nodes. So there are different ways of using the, uh, the, the, the nodes supplied as input to a function and that affect the streamability of that operation. And then static type we're more familiar with. We actually don't make that much use of type information, um, but it is used in the rules. Um, so the rules are complex. They're difficult to apply by hand. Um, but one can reduce the rules to a set of simple guidelines. And I think that's what Abel is trying to, going, going to try and show in, in his talk this, this afternoon. That most of the time, if you remember a few simple guidelines, you don't actually need to know the full complexity of the, of the rules. Um, in Saxonica, we've developed an, a, 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 a tool that implements the rules and allows you to evaluate the, the streamability of a style sheet. Um, and this is available online. Um, if I can get out of here. <laughs> I don't know why this, here we are. Um, so this is the, our streamability analysis tool. Um, this is developed by John Lumley. You can talk to him about it. He's in the second row there on the Saxonica bench. Um, what it allows you to do is to choose a file, and um, let's choose a file. This is fr I'm choosing files here from the W3C streamability tests, so we'll take the test for the max function, and I'll upload um, that style sheet with that set of tests, and then analyze it. And when I click on analyze, then what's happening is there's an application running on the server, which is actually an XSLT. Um, application. It's written entirely in XSLT, um, running under Florent Georges' Servlex environment. Um, and it's done the analysis on the server. And what it returns is an XML file that contains the results of that analysis, in other words, the results of the streamability rules. And I'm now displaying the results of those, that analysis using Saxon CE running in the, in the browser. Um, and what it does is it, it highlights the rules that are streamable with green, green ink. And whoops, there's one that isn't streamable. Um, that shouldn't have happened because these tests are supposed to be things that are streamable. Um, so um, that's something I need to investigate. Why is one of the streaming tests supposed to be um, streamable and isn't? Um, the reason is actually that it's streamable in Saxon and I wrote the test but it's not streamable according to the W3C rules, so we've got something wrong in the tests. That, that, that's why we have tests. Um, and this now allows me to investigate the test and, and, and see how to fix it. So when I, I don't bother about the green ones. They're OK. My intuition was correct. I thought they were streamable. They are. No need to worry any further. But I can investigate the, 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 the red ink. I can see um, what is it about this particular query that I thought was going to be streamable and isn't. 
I, I can actually investigate further by expanding the XPath expression into the full expression tree, and I can look at particular properties of each node on the tree by asking, for example, for the, the, the type, and I can ask for the, 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 the posture, and I can ask for the sweep. And so if I understand the rules, then I can start to investigate. Um, it's now annotated that tree with, with, with properties. This is striding, this is motionless, this is of this type, this is of that type. Um, so I can drill down and investigate what is it about this expression that causes it not to be, not to be streamable. Um, so you need that kind of tool because the, the rules really are extremely hard to apply by hand. Um, but with the help of a tool, um, it, it's possible. And I think you do get to the point where, where you learn the rules of thumb and you don't need to do that detailed exploration. With experience, you learn what's streamable and, and what isn't. So that tool is available online and you can, you can try it out. I don't guarantee that it will always be available online, but it is at the moment. Um, so to meet the challenge of designing a language that could be used for streaming but retained the characteristics of XSLT and being a streamable, uh, of being a functional and declarative language, um, we had to introduce some new constructs. The key challenge here is that if you can only see data once, then you need to remember what you've seen. And how do you remember what you've seen if you're not allowed to update variables? Well, we invented some ways around that within the functional paradigm. XSL iterate, um, Jonathan talked about fold as a higher order function. XSL iterate is syntactic sugar on top of a functional fold operation. So what it allows you to do, I mean, we don't present it that way to, the, to, to users, I hope. What we tell users is it's a for each with parameters. So at the end of each iteration of a for each, you can set some parameters and they're available in the next iteration. So you can go around a for each sequentially um, and each time you've got some data from the previous iterations. So it's a way of remembering what you've seen as you go through a for each. Um, it doesn't need mutable variables, it's much cleaner than that, um, but it does provide the opportunity to, to maintain state as you go along. Accumulators are a similar idea, except whereas XSL iterate iterates over a sequence, um, accumulators iterate hierarchically over the whole document. So as you're walking, as you're doing a document order tree walk of the document, each time you hit a node, um, by firing off patterns and rules, you can change the value of accumulator functions. And you're still in a purely functional paradigm because the, 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 the function that you're computing is a function of the nodes in the document and it will have the same value every time you compute it. Um, but you're working within a st uh, an environment where that feels a bit more procedural um, in that it's, it's, it's maintaining state, but in a clean functional sort of way. Um, both those operations need the ability to maintain state information. And we realized from doing use cases that that state information could become quite complex. The standard way of retaining complex information in, in, in the XSLT world is in, is in temporary trees. But temporary trees, are it's very difficult and expensive to make a small change to a, to, a, to a big tree. And so those weren't really suitable structure. And so we invented maps, which are now finding their way into XPath and XQuery at the 3.1 level, but in XSLT, maps are in the 3.0 level. Um, and if you're writing iterators and accumulators, you can use maps to retain the temporary information as you work through the sequence and, and maintain that state information. In a, um, and it can be as complex as you like because maps are sufficiently flexible. Um, maps are immutable. Um, it might seem like a surprise that when you, when you change a value in a map, what you get back is a new map, which sounds at first sight a bit expensive. It sounds like you're copying the whole structure which is what you'd probably have to do with XML. But with maps, there are well-known um, implementations of maps where making a change sort of implements it by means of a delta. So all you've done is add a small delta to the map. And you haven't copied all the existing data. Um, you've, you, you've just recorded the change. And so you can very efficiently represent structures that are immutable in terms of the semantics, 
but actually represented by holding deltas internally, so actually quite, quite efficient. So, talked about um, packages for handling large tile sheets, talked about streaming um, for handling um, large documents. Um, perhaps you don't have large style sheets, perhaps you don't have large documents. Is there anything here for you? Um, yes, there are a few things. There are quite a few other little goodies that um, we've put in along the way. Some of them motivated by those use cases, others just because we said we really must do this, it's high time. Um, try catch is available um, at the X query and XSLT level. It's not available in XPath. It's, a, it's an XSLT construct and an, it's an XQuery construct. Um, evaluate we've added, not as a function, but as an instruction, uh, because as an instruction it allows you to set parameters and set the context and control a lot more things in detail. So you've now got dynamic evaluation of XPath expressions. Um, we've added static variables. If you've ever used use when in style sheets, it provides a nice sort of conditional compilation facility, except it's very hard to sort of set, I want to switch debug on or I want to switch debug off. So use when can now refer to variables. They're called static variables. You have to declare them as static and you can then use them to control the conditional compilation of whether you want to do output the messages or not um, and, and so on. Um, to complement XSL message, there's now an assert facility. Um, it's a bit like assert wrapped in an, it wrapped in an XSL if because it essentially tests a, a, a dynamic condition and outputs a message if that condition is false. Um, so it's just a, a, a little convenience that, that um, you can currently do it with XSL message, but it's messy. Um, text value templates we've added, whoops. Um, so text value templates allow you to embed expressions in your text, avoid the need to write XSL value of. Um, that obviously creates a, a, a backwards compatibility problem because you can currently have curly braces in your content. Also, it makes life more difficult if you've got um, content that's rich in curly braces. If you want to generate CSS, if you want to generate JavaScript, then, then stealing the curly braces is, it would, is, is very unfriendly. Um, so that's something you have to switch on. And you can switch it on at the style sheet level, and then you can switch it off at any, any intermediate level. So it's controlled by a hierarchic attribute. You don't get that facility unless you switch it on, either for the whole style sheet or for the range of, of code in which you want to use it. Um, we borrowed that from XQuery, um, but we also changed it at the same time. Um, in XQuery, if $x is an element, then that will create a child element. In XSLT, it behaves exactly like it works in attribute values. Um, we'll atomize the element and give you a string. So text value templates always give you a, a, a string expansion, um, which we decided was the, 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 the less surprising way of it working. Um, so there's more in match patterns. There's more control over default templates. You can have a default template, which is the identity template. You can just declare. You, rather than writing the identity template out, you can say, this is the, I want my default template to be shallow copy, and it, it, it gives you that declaratively. Um, support for HTML5 serialization, I hope. I mean, if they stop changing HTML5, then it would help. <laughs> they tell me they're not going to stop changing it, so I don't know what we do about that. Um, Support for XPath 3.0, obviously, there's a lot of, in XPath 3.0. We've mentioned higher order functions. Jonathan talked about that. Um, the other most important thing you'll notice is more functions, and particularly the trig and math functions. If you're doing SVG output, you've now got a trigonometry library, which is very useful for, um, for that. Um, I must say, when I started out on XSLT, I never expected to be writing graphics programs in XSLT. Um, but you can do it very nice, and it works very nicely, and it's a very suitable language for the task, and I'd recommend it to anyone. Um, Unicode collation algorithm. Um, collation, support for collation URIs was in 2.0, but the big gap was that they were entirely implementation-defined. 
So you couldn't use a collation URI that said, I want Swedish collation in a way that would work on more than one processor. Um, what we've done here is define a collation URI syntax that invokes and parameterizes the Unicode collation algorithm. So you've got a way of saying, I want Swedish collation with uppercase before lowercase in a way that um, doesn't guarantee you get absolutely the same answer with every processor, but it, it, it at least gives an interoperable way of stating your intent. And quite a lot of other things like that. Um, so that's it. Um. Thank you.